Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Linda Hall. I'm here with Barb Tobias, Sandy Ricketts, Colleen Getz. We're all representing Connected Community. For those of you who this may be a first presentation for you, we are a nonprofit organization, parent founded here in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago, serving young adults with developmental disabilities and their families. And our focus is really on preparing for and navigating transition, but that incorporates a lot of different things, housing, uh, government uh, benefits, obviously things like we're talking about today with behaviors, um, lots of different things that parents are interested in knowing about and we're happy to provide that service. Um, we have a couple different things that we do here at CTC. We do customized employment services. We do social events for families. And this Friday Forum is part of a larger educational um, initiative that also includes uh, monthly informational tours and an annual transition summit. Um, so today, our speaker today is Diane Gould. Diane is a licensed clinical social worker and also a board certified behavior analyst. She has experience working in both private agencies and education systems and has served as a consultant and guest lecturer for many area school districts. She has also served on the professional advisory board of the Autism Society of Illinois and as the childhood disability and family support specialist for the Jewish Children's Bureau. Currently, Diane has a full-time private practice in suburban Chicago, where she serves neurodivergent children and adults and their families and provides support and guidance through life's transitions. We all know about that in this group. She is trained in social thinking and also offers the PEERS program, an evidence-based program focused on building meaningful relationships. And you presented on that program before, so I, I think did. we might have a video on that available oh. on our YouTube channel. Diane has been kind enough to participate in CT sem uh, CTC seminars several times in the past, and we're so grateful to have her with us again today to speak about reimagining behavioral support. So please help me welcome Diane Gould. Thank you so much. It's my uh, pleasure to be here. I love talking about behavior. And if you all <laughs> don't mind, maybe just like shoot in the chat, um, you know, kind of something about your child or your family, or if you're a professional where you work or something. And one of the kind women will read them out to me after I blah, blah, blah. I have so much I want to talk about, but uh, there, we don't have that much time. So I am going to talk really quickly. Right uh, so my first kind of introduction to human behavior was as a psych major and undergraduate in the 70s. And you had to train a rat to graduate as a psych major. And it was very scary at first, but I did learn about behavior and much of behavior and the research is across species. And I um, just got a dog, a new dog recently. So I've been doing a lot of training because she came as at five years old with no training. And I was pretty much struck a about how my methods I'm using to train my precious baby dog is uh, kind of what we use for humans. And one of the things I was thinking is maybe we shouldn't really use interventions meant for animals on children and young adults because they're different. And I know they're different because I like dogs much better than I like people. I probably shouldn't say that since you're taping it. But I've come to realize that people are not rats or pigeons. So we, we need to give our current methods some thought. All right, come on, change page. All right, all right, two. Um, do, does someone wanna call out kind of the things in the chat before I move on? Just right. a little now, we just have one. We just have oh. one um, professional oh, okay. with NWSRA manager at the okay. Adult Day program. Um, I know we have um, some parents um, who who we know who have um, loved ones in their mid twenties, some with higher functioning and some with lower functioning challenges. Um, and so, anyone else, feel free to um, put it in the chat, and I can share that with Diane as we go. All right. 
great. Oh, office manager oh. at Lance Farm. Oh, excellent. That was my first rejection letter when I was in college for <laughs> Lance Farm, too. Um, but it's so, but it's always had a, a warm place in my heart because of that. All right, I've got so much to talk about. I'm going to keep going and then I'll take a little break so you guys can can fill me in. So I've been, I love behavior stuff. So I've thought about it a lot over the years and I've changed my philosophies tons over the years. And I followed some great people in Europe now that the world has gotten so small. The psychologist I'll talk about, Bo in Sweden and Andy McDonald in the UK. I did some training in LA um, from Gary Lavinia. And now there's all this new stuff on the polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges, who's here, and Ross Green, some of you probably have heard of. Um, and about three years ago, I really started focusing on specializing on this small but complicated profile of autism called PDA, pathological demand avoidance, or um, pervasive drive for autonomy. And those individuals present with complex behaviors. And I've learned a lot about behavior from that movement in Europe and also the adults who fit this profile. I've also thought a lot about behavior from working with people with trauma histories too. And I'm one of those, those folks who are like always in my own head and overthink everything. I'm so sure that's really a concept because I think thinking is good. But anyhow, if there is, it is, if it is true, I overthink. So one of the things I've thought about and wrestled with, and I think it's good to wrestle with things, is kind of the ethics of behavior change. And that's kind of true if you're a parent or a professional is really thinking, what about if we get rid of certain behaviors? What if there's components of those behaviors that really make the individual happy or makes them who they are? And making sure we're not trying to make someone kind of less autistic or less disabled and more normal. And I think there's always a balance that's necessary between acceptance and change. Because the reality is, a lot of our interventions behaviorally, the ones I started my career with, involve putting hands on individuals, sometimes holding kids on the floor. And individuals with disabilities around the world have been hurt and even died at the hands of people who thought they were doing sound behavioral methods. Another thing that I've been really struck with and proudly overthinking is people often use behavioral interventions that make things worse. I often go into classrooms or job sites or day training programs and see the staff escalating the behavior, not calming it. And I'm going to end my presentation talking more about that. And just a little thing about the hands-on, because I'm afraid I'll forget to say it later, is, you know, we, we teach the kids when they're little a lot, and then they learn it. So they're, they're still having that knowledge when they're adults. And often with young kids, parents and professionals and educators, put their hands on kids, maybe putting them on their shoulders when they have something really important to say and that they want the individual to listen. And now I've worked with individuals in their 20s who are putting their hands on shoulders of their bosses or job coaches or parents, but now they're six feet tall or more and it feels more aggressive. But we taught them that. So, so just something to keep in mind in case I forget it too. So we do have the, the power, and that is a word that in, 
is related to behavior, to change behavior in others. But what we don't always understand is all the rewards, all the positive reinforcement in the world doesn't change someone's behavior if they don't have the skills. Uh, sometimes if I'm doing this in a live audience, I would ask someone in the audience if they could sing the Dutch national anthem. And if no one raises their hand, I might pick someone and say, all right, I'll give you a hundred bucks to do it. And they'll say, no, I still can't. And I'll say, all right, I'll give you $500 to do it. And it seems so silly, but I think we do that to kids all the time. We up the rewards or consequences when a child just doesn't have the skills. I've also come to realize that I think consequences aren't that important. I know that goes against kind of everything we think and everything we've been told, but it's really what happens before the behavior that matters. I hear a lot of teachers, especially, who are saying, well, I have to give a consequence or they won't learn not to do it. Yeah, that hasn't really been my experience. And, and some of you parents might wrestle with that. So I'm giving you permission not to give consequences. Uh, so when you're learning about behavior and any of you all who had a child with an IEP that included a behavior plan knows that the forms and the uh, functional analysis and behavior plans are all function-based. They're all about getting something or avoiding something. Generally in most school plans, it says both, um, even though even using a very traditional method, the interventions and supports would be the opposite pretty much for both. So um, it's, it's complicated. And sometimes what people are avoiding is internal or can't be seen by others, especially for kids who have a trauma background. And some individuals uh, with disabilities or autistic individuals have said that just going through life, being neurodivergent is a trauma and having systems not set up for them or the world um, a confusing place for them. So, so we'll talk about trauma too. So we also talk a lot about substitute behaviors when we're using traditional methods of behavior change, those replacement behaviors, and they're supposed to work easier or just as well. Often they don't, the ones I see in plans, but I, I have found that the problem or need needs to be addressed. And looking just at rewards and consequences, and I've seen a whole behavior plans just in rewards and consequences, it's not enough. And I've even seen that make things worse. I, one of the things I've learned through working with these individuals who fit this PDA pro profile of autism is that rewards, positives make things worse. They increase anxiety and make things worse which I had never really known. But, but we have to think deeply too. So when individuals need control and so sometimes that is what we think is behind behavior, I think 99% of the time it's because they're feeling anxious and we need to address the anxiety and provide space for them to be less anxious and change the environment. When people need attention, I feel they're needing assistance or a connection. So by just not giving them the attention, that doesn't address what they need. And, and that is dangerous to me and certainly gets in the way of trust and meeting that person's needs. And it sure isn't gonna help, help the behavior change positively. I also think with all the avoidance is that people, all of us avoid what we can't handle. So that's where escape, avoid, avoidance or even school refusal or not being willing to go to work or a day program. It's all about why. Why do they need to escape right now? What is in the, the setting? Do they need to avoid? 
why right now would they need to connect? How are they feeling? Or why would she need attention right now? Um, and Ross Green, who I'm hoping many of you have heard of, he is the one behind Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. Before that was um, Proactive Behavior. Um, oh, what was it called? Problem Solving, um, Collaborative Problem Solving. So whether you've tried his method or not, you can maybe let me know later. But one of the things I love that he says is that the challenging behavior is a signal that tells you there's a problem. It's not the problem in and itself. So it's like a fever that tells you there's an infection or an illness, but we focus on that instead of what's causing the problem. But if you can think of it as a signal, it's a game changer. The other thing Russ Green says and is famous for is that children do well if they can. And that would be the same with your young adults. Humans do well if they can. Everyone wants to do well. And if they can't, there's a problem. Also, I think we don't always realize that success is more motivating than failure. And if any of you have ever been on a diet, you know that's true. Um, humans are inconsistent. There's a lot of reasons for that, including stress and exhaustion. And we're all inconsistent. If you think of your life and your behavior, we're all inconsistent. On a given day, we can do things better or worse in another day. But somehow we expect people with special needs to be more consistent. I'll, I'll hear in a, let's say a school consultation, because I've done more of those than anything, teachers might say, well, I know he can handle assemblies because he handled the one last month. So he must not be trying today since he can't. Yeah, humans are, are, don't work that way. And it, it's just really complicated. So when you guys ask questions at the end, which hopefully we'll have time for, I'm giving you a little warning. Our brains don't think preventatively, but that's what is most helpful. So our questions usually go in the wrong direction. What should I do when he hits? What should I do when he won't get out of bed in the morning? What should I do when? But we want to think differently and preventatively. How do I keep them from hitting? Um, what's that behavior telling us about the individual? What needs unmet? What's going wrong for him? Those are the things that are gonna get you to long-term permanent solutions that don't cause side effects or harm. But it's not how we naturally think. And it's also not how we, we are taught. So um, this is my favorite slide, right? That our approach is backwards, that we focus on the behavior and not about the root cause or causes. And I get it. We just want to get rid of it um, for ourselves and for that other person. But what we get when we do that I mean, we miss the boat and we only will get short-term help. Um, so oh, here, Diane, oh, this, sure. this is an okay time to just give you an update. Yes, thank you. People's yes. Uh, background in the chat. Okay, so we've got our um, NWSRA manager at the Pursuit Adult Day Program, case manager at Lamb's Farm, a uh, parent of a 27-year-old nonverbal with autism and other health challenges health challenges, parent of a 28 year old with elopement, leaving home as well as day program, no longer going or stores feel right. like we, so what um, I said before is already pertain to you. So give that some thought, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And then looking for suggestions and then transition vocational coordinator, Nutrier high school, parent oh, of a 30 year old on the autism spectrum, parent of a 21 year old on the spectrum, uh, parent of a 23 year old who has been through hundreds of hours of ABA only to often wind up back at the beginning. Yep. All yeah. right. Thank All right. you. All right. Um, interesting. 
too. And that health thing, health is often uh, behind a lot of behavioral behaviors. So, so one of the things too is uh, we change the behavior of others by changing our own. And that really is the good news and the bad news too. Um, so know yourself really in terms of what triggers you, what behavior uh, is hardest for you, what you need to be effective supporting your child or your students or clients, how you deal with stress, your own history, how you were parented or how behavior was addressed in your life. And I also think humans are punitive. And I, I think it's a good thing to understand and accept. And I'm sure there's some of you going like, not me, I'm not. But I think it's our default. We sometimes, especially if we're stressed, don't want people to get away with things because it feels so bad for us to be helpless. Sometimes we want or think we're supposed to teach them a lesson, but really thinking about yourself and, and your thoughts and feelings when you're not able to support someone behaviorally too. Um, so you have to to understand behavior before you get rid of it. It's like a onion. You have to just keep going through the layers and the, the solutions do take time, but, uh, but dealing with challenging behavior does as well. And, and we kind of have us as humans, short-term brains. So often we're more willing to stop something a hundred times for a minute then take our time to really find a permanent solution. So we need to dig deep and look, you know, look for complex reasons, not simplistic explanations um, and understand why now, why this, and, and really trying not to blame ourselves or others or judge other people and for professionals or sometimes in families too, sometimes what makes us more punitive or focus on short, short term is that we don't want people to judge us or come in and see us not being effective or not taking a stand with someone. So if everyone could just not blame or stop being judgmental, it would, it would help. So the behavior, some of you probably have seen this, right? That we see is the tip of the iceberg, but our interventions need to focus on what's happening underneath. And that could be pain or communication differences or um, aut autism or a million things. And that's, or, sensory issues or overstimulation, everything. And that's where we need to focus, not just on what we see. That tells us what we're doing, if it, it's going in the right direction or not, if it's long-term. All right, I'm going to tell you just a quick little story, because I think it's helpful. We'll see about myself and behavior change, just to show you how complicated it is. And sometimes if you think about your own behavior change, I mean, most people can't keep one New Year's resolution, but an IEP generally is about 25 behaviors. We want the individual to change. Uh, so, all right, quick story. I have horrible eyesight and I uh, had a very nice eye doctor in the city and once a year I'd go to him and he'd say, how's your vision? And I'd say, well, I can see far with my contacts, but I really can't read or, or see up close. And he'd say, uh-huh, yeah, you need to wear reading glasses over your contacts. Then a year would pass. I'd go back. He'd ask the same question. How's your vision? And I, it's like Groundhog's Day. I would say, well, I can see far, but I really can't read or see anything up close with my contacts. And he'd go, uh-huh. You have to wear reading glasses every year. He was so patient. But one year, and it 
probably embarrassing to say it was probably four years down the road. I went to him on a Saturday afternoon and that Sunday morning, for some reason I was free, which never happens. So I went to my favorite coffee shop, which now is closed, Unicorn Cafe in Evanston and got kind of the Sunday papers and a huge latte and sat down at the table and was so excited to read. But then I looked down and yeah, I can't see it. I can't read. I don't know what I was thinking. But I had parked next door in front of CVS and I thought, oh, I bet they have reading glasses. I left my latte and the papers ran next door, $10. And three minutes later, I was back at Unicorn, so happy reading my newspaper and seeing. And I think what happened is I had that reminder, that motivation. I wanted to read the paper. It had just been yesterday when I had that conversation with the eye doctor. Uh, If it was a week before, I don't know if I would have had it top of mind to do it. It was so easy to get the um, reading glasses and it worked right away. And here I've never been, I, you know, like a, a lot of people, I have them in every room. I would never go anywhere without reading glasses now. And and it just, to me, showed um, just how complex changing behavior is. All these things had to come together, but we somehow lose sight how hard it is to. So one of the things that is not in behavior training is what I call the F word, but it's not what you think. It's feelings or emotions. And it's be- that's why behavior doesn't always seem logical because so much is anxiety driven and it's the feelings that are being escaped, not feeling uh, competent or feeling confused or feeling overwhelmed or feeling embarrassed. And no one likes to feel that way. But a lot of my clients escape or avoid because they don't want to feel that way. So we need to change the environment to change the feelings, to change the behavior. But in general, behavior plans are talking about behavior. No one talks about the emotions. And really some people, and sometimes, and maybe even us, we just lose it. The demands of a situation exceed an ability to cope. And that's just part of the human experience. And now I'd mentioned Stephen Porges at the beginning, and he's done all this work on the nervous system. So there's this concept of neuroception, and it's this unconscious surveillance to look out for threat and find safety. And that is what our brain tells us to, it is not a choice. And it's what triggers that fight, flight, or freeze instinct. And elopement, escape, that's flight. And arguing, fighting, or physical aggression is fight, or freeze is that shutdown or not answering when you talk to that person. And that is not a conscious choice. That is our our neuroception, our brains keeping us safe, trying to keep us from being eaten by tigers. And some people have very sensitive nervous systems, often autistic individuals, or people with trauma histories have very sensitive nervous systems. So they are seeking Um, safety and sensing threat, even when we don't too. So it's good to remember this. And I always picture their nervous system lit up or like that internal alarm going off like a a smoke detector in your house. Uh, One of my PDA colleagues says ours, you know, smoke detectors is like the one in your kitchen when you burn something on the stove. A lot of the individuals we support their smoke detector, their internal nervous system goes off if someone lights a cigarette down the block, right? So thinking that way, instead of interpreting behavior as on purpose or intentionally, and hopefully that will lead us to not taking behavior so personally and 
and changing how we react because so much of how we react makes things worse. I also think that we forget in traditional behavioral support with our focus on antecedents that generally antecedents are the last straw. Stress, anxiety builds up over time, which is why we're so inconsistent, why your child on one day can handle going to maybe a restaurant or some activity, but on another day can't. It's because there's so many things that happen in our lives in terms of how we're feeling, our stress level internally, the environments, all these things happen. And, and we're also different in how we respond to challenging behavior based on our stress level and everything we've gone through up until that moment. So you have to be a detective. You have to look underneath. You have to look very clearly with a magnifying glass. And if you want to make a plan, you really need to take time and you need to look for long-term, not short-term plans. And it has to be a good one. There's all kinds of behavior assessments. Ross Green on Lives in the Balance has this assessment on lagging skills that's free and you can do it. One of the things I loved, um, and this is going back decades and decades, there were these pioneers in the inclusion movement early in the day for people with disabilities and their behavior planning questionnaires and uh, approach never asked one question about behavior. And I love that. So write how to help someone expand and deepen their relationships, give them a sense of well-being and look at their health and have more fun and be in the community and make them feel like they're contributing and also to help them feel like they have more power and learn skills. And what help do the person's supporters, and that would be you guys, need to support that person? Because the takeaway is people who are well-supported, who feel power and control in their lives, have fulfilling relationships, have skills, feel successful, meaningful activities, have fun, make contributions and have a sense of well-being They feel and feel relaxed and heard, don't have challenging behavior. And those are things to look at, not the behavior. I love that. And we have to be careful when we get rid of behavior that we don't understand because we can cause more problematic behavior. And in my head, that's playing whack-a-mole. We get rid of one behavior and another pops up. My guess is most of you have had that experience. And we have to be careful that we're not eliminating a behavior that could actually be helpful to the individual. And a lot of what I see with that one is movement because when someone's nervous system is lit up, they're sensing threat and seeking safety, um, the blood flow goes to kind of the legs and increases the heart rate so we can move our bodies. So if there's <clears throat> an individual who's pacing or walking around and we try to eliminate that, excuse me for taking some water, that could cause, cause more serious behaviors. Um, so three most important factors for behavior change. Not sure if there are three most now, but I guess so. Yes. All right. Prevention, prevention, prevention. So think about that. It's what we do to prevent, not after. But we also want to prepare people for the real world, especially if it's in line with their goals. So we want to do skill building, but at the right time and in the right way, right? So there are certain things we can do. If we want to build skills, we need to figure out what those skills are and have them practice it. They have to be taught the skills and get fluent and sometimes overlearn the skills, especially if there's um, Anxiety, video modeling is, or video self-modeling is underutilized. And I, I 
underutilize it too. I don't know why, especially in this day and age, it's easy to do. If you take videos of what you want to see of the child, adult, student, client doing like this replacement behavior or a task, uh, and you film them doing it successfully, no errors, and have them watch it, that really builds skills. It, it works amazingly well, but it, it's underutilized. But we really have to understand what skills are weak or lacking uh, and partnering with the individual to figure that out and work on skill building instead of something you're doing to them makes a big difference. Um, so rewards. So my early trainings had pages and pages on positive rewards, but the more I've studied rewards and looked at them is that rewards focus on building motivation. But I, I don't know in any of the families and kids I've supported if motivation alone was really the, the problem. People want to do well. And rewards can build stress and pressure. They're very short term. And research says after rewards end, generally the people stop doing, doing these things. And it can get in the way of pleasure and get in the way of motivation. Uh, and often they're about compliance, so we don't want that because our focus on compliance can be very dangerous for individuals. And we've done that way too much for people with disabilities is taught them that compliance is the most valued trait. Um, so just a little bit on this is backward chaining, just something I think can be helpful for people. It's a behavioral term and it's kind of starting people at the end instead of the beginning of teaching a skill or an experience. So if you want someone to return to work or a day program that uh, hasn't been working for them and they've been leaving early, once you fix the problems, you might want them to start back, but at the end and then leave with everyone else. Or if you're teaching someone how to, let's say, make a sandwich, our instinct is always to teach at the beginning. But I think a lot of people learn best seeing the finished project and then working better. Uh, momentum also can be helpful is having a person engage in things that they've mastered, that they feel good about before you have them work on something challenging or a new skill. Um, transitions, sometimes we focus too much on what they don't wanna end instead of focusing on the new one. So communication, the other thing I wanna make sure I say is, is behaviors communication, just to make sure everybody knows that. But typically how we communicate to people about behavior and what we want them to do is doesn't work. It's not specific enough. Our expectations are too vague. We offer choices like, do you want to? Like there is one when there's not. And we need to explain to the person exactly the behavior we want to see and not what we don't wanna see. So I would say never, never mention what you don't wanna see because our brain goes to, to don'ts and stops. And my, my little fast story with this is I am not a morning person and I need coffee. And for a while I worked at Malloy School in Morton Grove and there was a Dunkin' Donuts next door and they were really crowded in the morning. But I would go and I'd get my giant large coffee and I'd order it with cream. And then I'd say no sugar. And because the people, you know, are in assembly line, they would have the sugar in their hand and I'd say no sugar and they'd hear the word sugar and they would start pouring. So I always had a little bit of sugar, which I don't like sweet coffee. In my, in my coffee, it was always a little sweet. So 
I was doing some work on behavior and writing a talk and I realized, oh, wait, I'm doing what I say not to. So I went the next day to Dunkin' Donuts and I said, gigantic coffee, cream only. And I never got sugar in it again. So don't ever mention what you don't want to see. So stop hitting, no running, none of that works. And the hardest intervention to do, I have found out, is nothing. To just not rush in, sit quietly and be present. We feel like we have to do something, but often that makes things worse. So think about sometimes doing nothing is the best approach. And what comes naturally to us, including that rushing in, is generally wrong. If you just think of how we talk about behavior or emotional uh, dysregulation with anyone, our instincts are wrong. We, we give all this wisdom and lessons to people when they're upset and they can't take in our pearls of wisdom, their brains, their upper brains are not online and they're not able to process information and learn. So we talk to them then, or we talk, tell them something after the fact, after someone spills their drink at dinner, we might say, be more careful. Or if someone trips, we might say, watch your step. Those are all too late. We also talk um, in don'ts, which doesn't help. We treat behavior challenges as knowledge deficits. We, and when they mostly aren't. So if at lunch, let's say at a day program or at a job, uh, your son takes someone else's lunch that looks better, who's sitting next to them, a parent or staff might explain, well, it's not nice to take your, your friend's meal. Well, they didn't do it because they thought it was nice or the right behavior. They did it because they couldn't handle the emotion of liking what that person had better. So, but we, we think it's knowledge and it's not. A lot of our explanations are about knowledge and we tell people to calm down. And there has never been a human in the history of the world who's calmed down when they're been told to calm down. It generally makes people more angry. I know it does for me. It's the last thing I want my husband to ever say to me when I'm upset. We also are sometimes misguided. We give people the level of support we want them to need instead of what they actually need. We also act that if we don't help someone when they're struggling, they'll be able to do it on their own. Yeah, not my experience. And we focus so much on independence because that's our fear that our children won't be independent. But I don't think we think so much about interdependence. And that's really what we all need. We need people. We Not for everything, possibly, but for some things and many things. And we might need different people for different tasks. And that's, I think, where we should think about there's a couple quotes I like. Uh, one is, we can't teach someone to swim in a few inches of water and can't teach them to swim in the deep end either. So finding the right situations. And um, this retired American psychologist talked when he was talking about crisis intervention is when a person's drowning is not the time to teach them to swim. In crisis, we need to save people. It's not a time to teach them. Um, a couple more quotes I like. Um, in children, and I think it's for all of us, anger is fear's bodyguard. So when your child or student or client is very angry, often they're afraid. And this African proverb, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. To have calm behavior, the behaviors we want people need to feel valued and liked and cared about and included. There's no substitute for that. All right, back to traditional behavior stuff for a little bit that, that I thought might help. Antecedent control. So removing seductive objects or people or unnecessary demands, provocative statements and actions, rearrange the environment. Most of behavior change can be accomplished 
with changing the environment. I'm going to change that to environment, not antecedents, really. Um, also, just having somebody to do to do something that they can't do uh, the challenging behavior with. My little thing I do is often just filling their arms purposefully, carrying things to from room to room if they are kind of pulling things off a bulletin board in school or um, or doing things with their hands. We don't want them. Have them carry something that is actually helpful. Don't make something up uh, to. So, so listening, I, I think all of us adults, myself included, we talk too much and don't listen enough. So really listening and making sure you understand the emotions, read back or repeat back what you've heard, what you think they're feeling and what they want, and don't try to convince them other ways or talk them out of their feelings because that's going to strengthen the intensity of their position try to meet them where they are you know i i know clients who as it let's say as a student will complain about their teachers or an adult complaining about their job coach or their boss to their parent and like most of parents and i did the same you say well you know um, your boss is trying to help or your teacher has a lot of students and that will make the individual like just fight harder. No, he's always mean. It strengthens their position, but that's naturally what we do. So remember, you don't have to talk. You can listen. We don't have to have the answers to show your understanding. I put this in too because a lot of uh, parents by the time your kid's an adult, you kind of are an expert on behavior and you've heard a lot of this planned ignoring. I don't think it's usually done correctly in the real world, but most importantly, I just wanna say this, I don't think humans should be ignored. I think there's a reason that they're needing something and I just don't think ignoring humans is a good idea. And after challenging behavior, we're all kind of taught to talk about it. But generally, I see more in, in settings than at homes that after challenging behavior, that processing becomes really shaming, that the child feels so badly. The focus might be to have them apologize. Some kids, it just re-triggers them. And, but we feel like we have to do it. We have to make sure they understand what they did wrong. You know, often it's the same behaviors over and over. They kind of know why, what they did wrong. I, I don't think it's always helpful to point it out. I think we need to use that time to reconnect and make sure everyone's good. I know people are gonna hate that I'm saying that, but I think the devils are in the, the details and little things make all the difference. Punishment, just a, a couple words on it, can hurt relationships. It doesn't teach people what to do next time. It can make settings aversive. They don't wanna go back to a place if there's been a punishment and timeouts don't generally work. They don't and um, they're still being done way too often. I also, this is part of the PDA movement that when you're telling people to do stuff, you need to see their window of tolerance at that moment and how anxious they are because most dis people with disabilities have anxiety. Um, most humans have anxiety, but people with disabilities often have a great amount of anxiety. So really thinking if you see this person isn't so regulated and seems anxious, it's probably a signal to you to drop the demands because most challenging behaviors come as a response to demands. Just a little reminder, kindness matters, compassion over compliance, caring over control, really trying to, to get into that mindset I know it seems basic, but it's not what I see done 
in the real world for many reasons. And one of my, my big things that I've been trying to like convince people out to do is blaming situations, not people, because that's not natural to us. So one of these groups I follow is this uh, low arousal group um, or low arousal technique invented by Andrew McDonald in Studio 3 in London. And it's done with parents and professionals. And it's really the focus of altering the adult or the staff person or parents behavior and not the individual that we're focused on. So that to me felt great and made a lot, made a lot of sense. And, and their focus is generally crisis intervention. So in practice, it looks like not a lot of talking, reducing environmental arousal, being aware of nonverbal cues that we're giving out. Oh, it says cures, but it should be cues. Being aware of your own belief and being and behavior and being reflective. And I know with most parents and professionals, we're just too busy to prioritize being reflective, but it makes a difference. So we need to know how we react to stress thinking about the proactive that I've seen, not forcing compliance. No one really wants their kids to grow up to be compliant. That's not what people say, but so much of our emphasis is on compliance. And as I said earlier, I think that's dangerous. It can make our children or our clients, targets, victims be taken advantage of because we've taught them Compliance is so important. What we need to do is lower stress, reduce demands and pressure, and be low key instead of domineering. And when we're angry, we can look very domineering because we want control to manage our stress. So Andy, who's you know the creator of this program, he talks about focus and manage the stress, not the behavior. So I added that painting the scream on there. So if you're going to put something on your refrigerator, think about that. This one, the stress, not the behavior. And I am um, in love with this Swedish psychologist. He has a bunch of short YouTubes. He's very like matter of fact, funny. So he just says, all you have to do, manage behavior without escalating it. So that's that key without is escalating, figure out what went wrong and then fix it after. And he, I love his books. And uh, if I could, if anyone wants me to hold up the cover later, I will. So he talks about that many of us think that the individual has much more control over their behavior than they do. And we assign motive. We also don't realize that emotion or affect is contagious. So if we're angry, if we're frustrated, if we're lit up, then that's going to be contagious to the person we're trying to support. And also that a lot of the behaviors we're seeing are caused by stress. So looking at the stress. They also might serve protective factors to keep them safe. And we often just need to adjust the demands because we are kind of demand machines. So he breaks it down when behavior is starting to escalate, keep calm or look that way. Use a calm voice, don't use eye contact, avoid anything that looks like you're dominating and keep a distance, step back, don't follow them. And anytime you're trying to make a demand, giving them anything to do, step back farther. So you're trying not to emphasize yourself. You can even sit down, create a diversion. I often kind of just like spill my water. You can change out the adults. Um, and sometimes you just have to give in. And when things are really escalating, Often things pass without doing anything. Make sure other people leave the area so there's not an audience. Try not to touch them. Even, you know, if you do have to touch them, try to, not to be tense, but try not to touch. And if somebody grabs you, just um, kind of relax. And when things are calming down, just wait and stay calm. If there's a mess, the parent and teacher 
should clean them up, even though that's different than everything you've been taught. And divert onwards, get back to normal as soon as possible. You can have some hot chocolate and sit quietly. You don't have to talk, provide comfort. Because trying to, to force people to talk doesn't work. And I know that people are afraid that if you do this number four, you are rewarding and reinforcing that bad behavior, even if they trash the room. But that's not the case. And if anything, they've stopped. So you're re reinforcing stopping. But it's really about reconnecting and getting things back to normal scientifically has been proven, decreases the chances of another challenge too. So close is no cigar. So it's hard work to change behavior. No one size fits all really work on thinking proactively, not reactively. And it, it's pretty much guaranteed it takes you guys doing something different. And one of the things I think about a lot is that most of the kids and adults I support, they're pretty rigid folks. And we need to combat that with being flexible. It's not that rigid and rigid equal flexible, but so often our approaches to behavioral challenges is rigid. We get more rigid when our clients are getting more rigid or our children. And pushing someone when they're in that state only is going to make it worse, only is going to have them dig in deeper. And people have to be emotionally regulated to listen. So we need to connect with them emotionally to get any movement. They have to feel heard and that we, we see them, we hear them, we feel them. And we have to go with the flow, not against it. And that is not natural for us because we have nervous systems too that get lit up. A lot of parents or staff members will say to me, he's so argumentative. We argue all the time. And sometimes I remind them it takes two to argue. So you want to focus on the relationship, whether it's your child, whether it's your student, whether it's your client. There's no technique or skill or therapy that's more important than the relationship. And to do that, we have to keep cool. So we need to practice self-care. We need to take care of ourselves because we can't calm someone down if we're not calm. Because what is part of that nervous system seeking safety is they need someone to co-regulate with them. They need someone who's calm. And that's why timeouts don't work so much for most people, because when someone's alone, they can't co-regulate. So they need you to be their person. So don't join their chaos, lend them your calm. So be kind to yourself. You're going to make mistakes. This is hard. Um, and now I am happy to take questions. And I was on time, which never happens. So um, that is crazy. And All right. So oh, much. Good. So this is this Thanks. is excellent. Let me go oh, ahead good. and ask the questions. Okay. So the uh, the uh, parent of the uh, the twenty eight year old with a loaf elopement, okay. leaving home as well as day program, no longer going or to stores. Feel like we have tried everything. Any suggestions? Thank you. So. I would really try to figure out what's going wrong in those, those settings and solve the problems. And then I would make them go right. And then have, I mean, I, course I need to know like a ton more, but I'm giving you like the quick and dirty because it's all like wise, wise, wise. But then I would try to build back things at the end for very short, very positive, um, you know, time periods. So it might be going into store to buy his favorite thing for less than two minutes. And I would also make it clear that 
he has a method of asking to leave escape card signal whatever and it's honored and respected and practiced because he's probably going to need to be sure that if he needs to leave he can leave so it's and it's different than what i used to do when i like was more of a behavior person uh or more traditional because i now i think about it that i used to make um people like do one more thing like under my control before they could leave because that was how I taught and now I just can't believe I did that I can't believe I did a lot of things early in my career uh but yeah no they need to know that they can leave when they need to leave so make that clear um too oh and I'm just looking at this love that quote don't don't join the chaos and I noticed it because I'm like freaking out that I didn't put who said it on the slide because I stole it. And I think it was Dan Siegel. Um, I know now we're on YouTube and I stole someone's thing, but I think that's who said it, but I love it too. All right. More questions. Hope that okay. helps. Yeah. So, um, okay. One of the direct questions is um, the 26 year old male with down syndrome last year started talking uh, to self much more counting etc any ideas? I, I would wonder if something is causing him more stress and and trying to figure out what that's about and also I'd be careful about taking it away if anyone's trying to, because talking to himself, counting are all ways to process kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. And we want him to be able to process. I, I always think, and this is for all people, neurodivergent, neurotypical, half the population seems to process aloud and half in our own heads. And, um, you know, the, there's always those talkers out there. That's how they make sense of the world. So your son is trying to make sense of things. So we don't want him not to be able to. So I, and we certainly don't want to give him any messages not to, if we haven't figured out why he might be more stressed, because there might be clues in there too. And I'd probably want to really help him with stress reduction at the same time. And, and you might find out these are things that he's doing for stress reduction too. So I wouldn't worry about it necessarily. I know there's certain times and places that it might be more of a problem so you might want to help with that. Maybe if you're, I don't know, somewhere, a religious service or something that you might think, oh, this isn't the right time. You might want to just go take a break with him or walk and, and allow him to do it, not giving the message, we have to leave because you're doing it, like in a, in a negative way. Hope that helps. Okay. All right. The next question is, how do you suggest approaching the situation where a provider caregiver is over-focusing on getting a child or student to apologize? Oh, I hate that. Um, see, I can feel like I can feel my nervous system. And, and what I don't get is that... But what we even should want is remorse. And remorse has nothing to do with apology. And if anything, I think saying I'm sorry can make people not feel remorse, which we don't want people to you know, be overcome with guilt, but remorse is healthy. I think when we make mistakes, we all do. But 
when we have people do meaningless I'm sorry's, that makes them think, all right, when they do it, if they're willing, great. I don't need to think about this. We're all good because they said those two words. Where we want to focus on what happened and moving on and allow maybe somebody to do something nice for that person that they had a problem with, which I, I like kind of better. If there is remorse, what can we do? Can we, you know, bake them something or do something nice for them or hand them a, their coffee or I don't know, something that makes more sense to me. Just those words make no sense. And, and we even know from young kids, because we everything starts when we're younger, kids have said, well, I said, I'm sorry. Like, why isn't this over? Like, why are, do they still have emotions about us? Why can't I then go to the park? Why am I being punished? I said, I'm sorry. It just makes no sense. So you can blame me. Um, blame it on me that you went to a training and that's what the speaker said. And hopefully you can educate them. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe you can get them to focus on that idea of remorse and not pushing it. It needs to come from the person if it's really an apology, not be imposed. I don't know if anything I said was helpful, but I, I'm with you. It's just so unhelpful and can get in the way of what really we want to happen. And if that's what the person's insisting on, they're probably insisting on other things that aren't so helpful either. Maybe, it, oh, I was going to say you could show the video, but not so much if if, the, if these are being recorded too, and they probably are, so you can't. You can't have them show the video. I, should, I forgot questions are... So I have to be careful on how I answer. Thank you. Okay. That's all right. This is helpful. 24-year-old um, with autism, sensory issues, and OCD. How, to, how do we handle the OCD behaviors? It's so hard. I think it depends on what they are and how disruptive they are. The treatment for OCD is about exposure, generally. I don't know how many practitioners are so skilled at working on OCD with individuals with intellectual disabilities. Some programs focus on that with autistic individuals. I think things can get worse before they get better. And that needs to really be thought through. A lot of autistic individuals have OCD. So a lot depends depends on how, um, like how much it's interfering. And if you've tried those traditional methods or not, sometimes they give kind of competing behaviors to try to, to change them or interrupting the cycles. The thought is that it kind of tricks the brain to stop requiring kind of the compulsion part if you don't do them, kind of blocking it. Uh, so, so it depends and probably needs to be individualized. So I know I'd, I'm not really help, helping that parent. I'm so sorry. Um, well, they can reach out to you, correct? Sure, yeah. sure. Okay. Um, I'm just flipping back to um, an earlier question or comment. Parent of a 23-year-old who has been through hundreds of hours of ABA only yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, I think that, so ABA is just so controversial. Uh, I don't know where to start. I know that adult, like autistic adults, feel ABA can be abusive or is abusive, that 
the focus is taking away their autism. Um, thanks, Diane. That it has been compared to conversion therapy that has been used to change uh, in the early days, gay individuals and make them straight. And Lovas, who's kind of the king of ABA, may have been involved with that. So that's something to keep in mind. And also keep in mind that some of the ABA doesn't generalize and just works on kind of more discreet skills where I know I've heard from a lot of behavior analysts in the last year that they are trying to change their approach to have it more community focused, to have it more relational, to be more flexible. So I think providers vary. One of the things I've focused on in the last few years is that for many individuals, rewards and consequences, or even just rewards, don't help and can make things worse. And all ABA focuses on rewards. So that is something to think about. So it might be the approach, it might be that rewards don't work, it might be the practitioners, it might be too consequence driven. But I would think if something's not working, try other things, try more relational and situational approaches. I, I know that it's hard for some families to go against what they have been told to do. And when you've got an autistic child, you are told to do ABA. It's the only evidence-based treatment for autism, blah, blah, blah. And there's not really a psychological evaluation of an autistic individual that doesn't say that. No, maybe that's not true. Maybe that was back in the day. Maybe things are changing. But I do think parents need to give themselves permission not to do things that professionals tell them to do. All right, I'm going to get hate mail. But you know your child best. You know what works and what doesn't work, not just for your child, but for your life, for your family. You're the expert. And to keep trying things that don't work makes no sense to me. And you've got that historical perspective where most professionals, even myself, like we come in and out of people's life. So we're not at the same starting place. And what really worries me the most is that when parents are getting pressured by professionals, that forces them to pressure their child. And generally our kids do not do well with pressure because life is filled with um, pressure. Um, all right, I'm looking at Amy's thing. All right. Okay. Um, maybe, you... maybe one more question because we, I'm looking at that time. All right. Um, or two. Okay. Do you have any tips for supporting individuals for whom praise and compliments increases anxiety and triggers behavior? Sure. So don't, don't do them. Don't do it directly. Uh, and tell everyone who comes in contact with your child not to do them. See if your child can tolerate indirect praise, like overhearing you say something um, to someone else about your child. Because sometimes people can handle it if it's indirect. Um, cause it, it doesn't pour the attention on them, but some people can't handle it. It makes them so nervous that 
the expectation now is high. And what if they can't meet that expectation next time? And sometimes it even prevents them from being able to do that task again, because it might not be as good as the one they got praised for. So I'm thinking kind of in my head of like drawing and they get a ton of praise and then they were, what if the next drawing is not so good? I better not draw. And that is really sad. So I think testing if indirect works better than overhearing it, but if not, just, um, just maybe a nonverbal, even a little smile when you look at something, see what they can tolerate. Okay. Too. Uh, we have two quick little questions. Okay, it, All right, let's do them really quick. Yeah. Okay, I use a chart with rules and each night my daughter asks me to check it and seems proud. I think due to distraction or language disorder, it helps remind her and cuts out a, a lot of problem. There are no punishments or rewards. It's just a monitor. If I focus on getting more of her input, could this still be useful? It depends. And it depends on who you ask. I mean, I think it depends also on if there's ever days that she's not doing a lot, does she feel discouraged? You want it also to be about her and not about you necessarily pleasing you. Often getting individuals input is is great just on all areas. I guess I'd also wonder how do you know the chart makes a difference? And she wouldn't be doing the behavior anyhow, those things. And do you plan to keep it up forever? Uh, because sometimes that's an issue. Like now, is it just a habit? Could it be replaced with uh, a different nighttime ritual? Is that kind of what it's doing? Um, you maybe could focus on one of the skills instead of a whole thing, but, but there's no one size fits all. And again, you guys know your, your kids the best too. Amy and yes, you can have my handouts. Somebody's okay, saying. awesome. And Amy says uh, she reads it and says it helps. Uh, we upgrade. Okay, last question here. Uh, agree with the controversy over ABA. Are you familiar with ACT, Acceptance Commitment Therapy? And have you seen any success with this methodology? I. Um, it's a great question. Yes, I think ACT is a, a really good approach. I think it all depends on the practitioner. It makes me worry, saying this on recording, but it makes me worry for behavior analysts to go to a two-day ACT workshop and then do ACT with their clients if they don't have a good understanding of human emotions and all the kind of traditional therapy skills and know a lot about building relationships because whether it's act or not relationship with the therapist is the, the most important component. So act is good, but it, so that's a yes, but I think it matters who is doing it. But thanks for asking that too. Okay, Diane, you've got a ton of thank yous and appreciate Oh, thanks. It was really fun. I love talking about this. And you keep, have all night I'm like thinking of things to say. <laughs> yeah, that right? Well, thank you. We appreciate being able to share the PowerPoint with everyone who's attended. That's so gracious of you and that's so much good information. And do you have any classes for parents to take? Hmm. Um, classes? I'm always willing to do presentations. For PDA, we're gonna have more kind of classes. We've got a conference coming up. That's that profile of autism demand avoidance. Um, that's coming up March 2nd and 3rd in Chicago. So that will be a ton of information. It's virtual and in-person hybrid. 
happy to do classes. I know parents are so busy. I don't know if anyone would go, but I'm always <laughs> willing to do some stuff. I love talking about behavior and helping parents. I do consultations for parents. Uh, I do trainings and consultations for settings for schools and agencies. So, um, to so uh, yeah, Cherie says she could, she would love that, and she can round up uh, parents to make it happen in this area. So, Cherie. <laughs> You, now it's your task to make that happen. And we certainly appreciate that. That would be awesome to have Diane helping out in this area. Awesome. I, I, my, my disclaimer is I right now I'm working seven days a week and not able to get the work I need done because I'm having a lot of fun and I keep doing more and more and I'm supposed to be writing a book, but, um, um, but I will try my best. I love working with parents. So the conference in Chicago, if you go on PDA North America's website, oh, I don't even have it on my website. I just realized. So go to PDA North America's website or email me and I'll give you the conference info. And um, I love spreading the word because so much of behavior I've learned from the PDA movement. And I just like how behavior is dealt with for PDA. Um, all right, wonderful. Diana, you. If, if you are interested, if you are willing to share your PowerPoint, if you want to send it to us, we'll send it out to people who sure. Uh, Can I give you the handouts right? page? Yeah, whatever you whatever sure. you want to give to us, that would be great. I'll share that. Thanks for fitting us into your busy schedule. <laughs> sure, sure. And nag me if um if need be. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for your time, everyone. Have a good rest of your day and a great weekend. It's going to be sunny and nice. So enjoy. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.